Chapter Twenty Six of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume One: The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Aramis and his thesis. D'Artagnan had said nothing to Porthos of his wound or of his procurator's wife. Our Bernays was a prudent lad, however young he might be. Consequently, he had appeared to believe all that the vainglorious musketeer had told him convinced that no friendship will hold out against a surprised secret. Besides, we feel always a sort of mental superiority over those whose lives we know better than they suppose. In his projects of intrigue for the future, and determined as he was to make his three friends the instruments of his fortune, D'Artagnan was not sorry at getting into his grasp beforehand the invisible strings by which he reckoned upon moving them. And yet, as he journeyed along, a profound sadness weighed upon his heart— he thought of that young and pretty Madame Bonacieux who was to have paid him the price of his devotedness. But let us hasten to say that this sadness possessed the young man less from the regret of the happiness he had missed than from the fear he entertained that some serious misfortune had befallen the poor woman. For himself, he had no doubt she was a victim of the cardinal's vengeance, and as was well known, the vengeance of his eminence was terrible. How he had found grace in the eyes of the minister he did not know, but without doubt M. de Cavois would have revealed this to him if the captain of the guards had found him at home. Nothing makes time pass more quickly, or more shortens a journey, than a thought which absorbs in itself all the faculties of the organization of him who thinks. External existence then resembles a sleep of which this thought is the dream. By its influence time has no longer measure, space has no longer distance. We depart from our one place and arrive at another, that is all. Of the interval past, nothing remains in the memory but a vague mist in which a thousand confused images of trees, mountains, and landscapes are lost. It was as a prey to this hallucination that D'Artagnan traveled, at whatever pace his horse pleased, the six or eight leagues that separated Chantilly from Crevacor. Without his being able to remember on his arrival in the village, any of the things he had passed or met with on the road. There only his memory returned to him. He shook his head, perceived the cabaret at which he had left Aramis, and putting his horse to the trot, he shortly pulled up at the door. This time it was not a host but a hostess who received him. D'Artagnan was a physiognomist. His eye took in at a glance the plump, cheerful countenance of the mistress of the place, and he at once perceived there was no occasion for dissembling with her or of fearing anything from one blessed with such a joyous physiognomy. "'My good dame,' asked D'Artagnan, "'can you tell me what has become of one of my friends whom we were obliged to leave here about a dozen days ago?' "'A handsome young man, three or four and twenty years old, mild, amiable, and well-made.' "'That is he, wounded in the shoulder.' "'Just so. Well, monsieur, he is still here.' "'Ah, pardieu, my dear dame,' said D'Artagnan, springing from his horse and throwing the bridle to Planchet. "'You restore me to life. Where is this dear Aramis? Let me embrace him. I am in a hurry to see him again.' "'Pardon, monsieur, but I doubt whether he can see you at this moment.' "'Why so? Has he a lady with him?' "'Jesus! What do you mean by that, a poor lad?' "'No, monsieur, he has not a lady with him.' "'With whom is he, then?' "'With the curate of Montdidier, and the superior of the Jesuits of Amiens.' "'Good heavens!' cried D'Artagnan. "'Is the poor fellow worse, then?' "'No, monsieur, quite the contrary. But after his illness, Grace touched him, and he determined to take orders.' "'That's it,' said D'Artagnan. I had forgotten that he was only a musketeer for a time. Monsieur still insists upon seeing him. More than ever. Well, Monsieur has only to take the right-hand staircase in the courtyard and knock at number five on the second floor. D'Artagnan walked quickly in the direction indicated and found one of those exterior staircases that are still to be seen in the yards of our old-fashioned taverns. But there was no getting at the place of sojourn of the future abbe. The defiles of the chamber of Aramis were as well guarded as the gardens of Armida. 
Bazin was stationed in the corridor, and barred his passage with the more intrepidity that, after many years of trial, Bazin found himself near a result of which he had ever been ambitious. In fact, the dream of poor Bazin had always been to serve a churchman, and he awaited with impatience the moment, always in the future, when Aramis would throw aside the uniform and assume the cassock. The daily renewed promise of the young man that the moment would not long be delayed had alone kept him in the service of a musketeer, a service in which he said his soul was in constant jeopardy. Bazin was then at the height of joy. In all probability this time his master would not retract. The union of physical pain with moral uneasiness had produced the effect so long desired. Aramis, suffering at once in body and mind, had at length fixed his eyes and thoughts upon religion, and he had considered as a warning from heaven the double accident which had happened to him, that is to say, the sudden disappearance of his mistress and the wound in his shoulder. It may be easily understood that in the present disposition of his master nothing could be more disagreeable to Bazin than the arrival of D'Artagnan, which might cast his master back again into that vortex of mundane affairs which had so long carried him away. He resolved then to defend the door bravely, and as betrayed by the mistress of the inn, he could not say that Aramis was absent. He endeavored to prove to the newcomer that it would be the height of indiscretion to disturb his master in his pious conference, which had commenced with the morning, and would not, as Bazin said, terminate before night. But D'Artagnan took very little heed of the eloquent discourse of M. Bazin, and as he had no desire to support a polemic discussion with his friend's valet, he simply moved him out of the way with one hand, and with the other turned the handle of the door of number five. The door opened, and D'Artagnan went into the chamber. Aramis, in a black gown, his head enveloped in a sort of round flat cap, not much unlike a calotte, was seated before an oblong table, covered with rolls of paper and enormous volumes in folio. At his right hand was placed the superior of the Jesuits, and on his left the curate of Montdidier. The curtains were half drawn, and only admitted the mysterious light calculated for beatific reveries. All the mundane objects that generally strike the eye on entering the room of a young man, particularly when that young man is a musketeer, had disappeared as if by enchantment, and for fear, no doubt, that the sight of them might bring his master back to ideas of this world, Bazin had laid his hands upon sword, pistols, plumed hat, and embroideries and laces of all kinds and sorts. In their stead, D'Artagnan thought he perceived in an obscure corner a disciplined cord suspended from a nail in the wall. At the noise made by D'Artagnan in entering, Aramis lifted up his head and beheld his friend. But to the great astonishment of the young man, the sight of him did not produce much effect upon the musketeer, so completely was his mind detached from the things of this world. "'Good day, dear D'Artagnan,' said Aramis. "'Believe me, I am glad to see you.' "'So am I delighted to see you,' said D'Artagnan, "'although I am not yet sure that it is Aramis I am speaking to.' "'To himself, my friend, to himself. But what makes you doubt it?' I was afraid I had made a mistake in the chamber, and that I had found my way into the apartment of some churchman. Then another error seized me on seeing you in company with these gentlemen. I was afraid you were dangerously ill. The two men in black, who guessed D'Artagnan's meaning, darted at him a glance which might have been thought threatening, but D'Artagnan took no heed of it. "'I disturb you, perhaps, my dear Aramis,' continued D'Artagnan, for by what I see I am led to believe that you are confessing to these gentlemen. Aramis colored imperceptibly. You disturb me? Oh, quite the contrary, dear friend. I swear, and as a proof of what I say, permit me to declare I am rejoiced to see you safe and sound. Ah, you'll come round, thought D'Artagnan. That's not bad. This gentleman, who is my friend, has just escaped from a serious danger, continued Aramis with unction, 
pointing to D'Artagnan with his hand and addressing the two ecclesiastics. "'Praise God, monsieur,' replied they, bowing together. "'I have not failed to do so, your reverences,' replied the young man, returning their salutations. "'You arrive in good time, dear D'Artagnan,' said Aramis, "'and by taking part in our discussion may assist us with your intelligence, Monsieur the Principal of Amiens, Monsieur the Curate of Montdidier, and I are arguing certain theological questions, in which we have been much interested. I shall be delighted to have your opinion. The opinion of a swordsman can have very little weight, replied D'Artagnan, who began to be uneasy at the turn things were taking. And you had better be satisfied, believe me, with the knowledge of these gentlemen. The two men in black bowed in their turn. "'On the contrary,' replied Aramis, "'your opinion will be very valuable. The question is this. Monsieur the Principal thinks that my thesis ought to be dogmatic and didactic.' "'Your thesis? Are you then making a thesis?' "'Without doubt,' replied the Jesuit. "'In the examination which precedes ordination, a thesis is always a requisite.' ordination cried d'artagnan who could not believe what the hostess and bazin had successively told him and he gazed half stupefied upon the three persons before him now continued aramis taking the same graceful position in his easy chair that he would have assumed in bed and complacently examining his hand which was as white and plump as that of a woman and which he held in the air to cause the blood to descend now as you have heard d'artagnan monsieur the principal is desirous that my thesis should be dogmatic while i for my part would rather it should be ideal this is the reason why monsieur the principal has proposed to me the following subject which has not yet been treated upon and in which i perceive there is matter for magnificent elaboration utraque manus in benedicendo clericis inferioribus necessaria est d'artagnan whose erudition we are well acquainted with evinced no more interest on hearing this quotation than he had at that of m de treville in allusion to the gifts he pretended that d'artagnan had received from the duke of buckingham which means resumed aramis that he might perfectly understand the two hands are indispensable for priests of the inferior orders when they bestow the benediction an admirable subject cried the jesuit admirable and dogmatic repeated the curate who about as strong as d'artagnan with respect to latin carefully watched the jesuit in order to keep step with him and repeated his words like an echo as to d'artagnan he remained perfectly insensible to the enthusiasm of the two men in black yes admirable porsos admirabile continued aramis but which requires a profound study of both the scriptures and the fathers now i have confessed to these learned ecclesiastics and that in all humility that the duties of mounting guard and the service of the king have caused me to neglect study a little i should find myself therefore more at my ease facilis natans in a subject of my own choice which would be to these hard theological questions what morals are to metaphysics in philosophy d'artagnan began to be tired and so did the curate see what an exordium cried the jesuit exordium repeated the curate for the sake of saying something Que mad modum inter celorum imnestitatum. Aramis cast a glance upon D'Artagnan to see what effect all this produced, and found his friend gaping enough to split his jaws. Let us speak French, my father, said he to the Jesuit. Monsieur D'Artagnan will enjoy our conversation better. Yes, replied D'Artagnan. I am fatigued with reading, and all this Latin confuses me. Certainly, replied the Jesuit, a little put out. 
while the curate, greatly delighted, turned upon D'Artagnan a look of full gratitude. "'Well, let us see what is to be derived from this gloss. Moses, the servant of God, he was but a servant. Please to understand Moses, blessed with his hands. He held out both his arms while the Hebrews beat their enemies, and then he blessed them with his two hands. Besides, what does the gospel say? Imponite manus, and not manum place the hands, not the hand. Place the hands, repeated the curate with a gesture. St. Peter, on the contrary, of whom the popes are the successors, continued the Jesuit. Porige gigitos, present the fingers. Are you there now? Certes, replied Aramis in a pleased tone, but the thing is subtle. The fingers, resumed the Jesuit, St. Peter blessed with the fingers, the Pope therefore blesses with the fingers. And with how many fingers does he bless? With three fingers, to be sure, one for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Ghost. All crossed themselves. D'Artagnan thought it was proper to follow this example. The Pope is the successor of St. Peter, and represents the three divine powers. The rest, ordines inferiores, of the ecclesiastical hierarchy, bless in the name of the holy archangels and angels. The most humble clerks, such as our deacons and sacristans, bless with holy water sprinklers, which resemble an infinite number of blessing fingers. There is the subject simplified. Argumentum omni denudatum ornamento. I could make of that subject two volumes of this size, continued the Jesuit, and in his enthusiasm he struck a St. Chrysostom in folio, which made the table bend beneath its weight. D'Artagnan trembled. Certes, said Aramis, I do justice to the beauties of this thesis, but at the same time I perceive it would be overwhelming for me. I had chosen this text, tell me, dear D'Artagnan, if it is not to your taste. Non inutile est desiderium in oblatione, that is, a little regret is not unsuitable in an offering to the Lord. Stop there, cried the Jesuit, for that thesis touches closely upon heresy. There is a proposition almost like it in the Augustinus of the heresiarch Jansenius, whose book will sooner or later be burned by the hands of the executioner. Take care, my young friend. You are inclining toward false doctrines, my young friend. You will be lost. You will be lost, said the curate, shaking his head sorrowly. You approach that famous point of free will, which is a mortal rock. You face the insinuations of the Pelagians and the semi-Pelagians. But, my reverend, replied Aramis, a little amazed by the shower of arguments that poured upon his head, how will you prove, continued the Jesuit, without allowing him time to speak, that we ought to regret the world when we offer ourselves to God? Listen to this dilemma. God is God, and the world is the devil. To regret the world is to regret the devil. That is my conclusion. And that is mine also, said the curate. But for heaven's sake, resumed Aramis. Desideras diabolum, unhappy man, cried the Jesuit. He regrets the devil. Ah, my young friend, added the curate, groaning. Do not regret the devil, I implore you. D'Artagnan felt himself bewildered. It seemed to him as though he were in a madhouse and was becoming as mad as those he saw. 
He was, however, forced to hold his tongue from not comprehending half the language they employed. But listen to me, then, resumed Aramis with politeness mingled with a little impatience. I do not say I regret. No, I will never pronounce that sentence, which would not be orthodox. The Jesuit raised his hands toward heaven, and the curate did the same. No, but pray grant me that it is acting with an ill grace to offer to the Lord only that which we are perfectly disgusted. Don't you think so, D'Artagnan? I think so indeed, cried he. The Jesuit and the curate quite started from their chairs. This is the point of departure. It is a syllogism. The world is not wanting in attractions. I quit the world, then I make a sacrifice. Now the scripture says positively, Make a sacrifice unto the Lord. That is true, said his antagonist. And then, said Aramis, pinching his ear to make it red as he rubbed his hands to make them white, and then I made a certain rondeau upon it last year, which I showed to Monsieur Voiture, and that great man paid me a thousand compliments. A rondeau, said the Jesuit disdainfully. A rondeau, said the curate mechanically. Repeat it, repeat it, cried D'Artagnan. It will make a little change. Not so, for it is religious, replied Aramis. It is theology in verse. The devil, said D'Artagnan. Here it is said Aramis, with a little look of diffidence, which, however, was not exempt from a shade of hypocrisy. Vous qui pleurez un pas plein de charme, et qui traînez des jours infortune. Tous vos malheurs se verront termine, quand Dieu seul vous offrirez vos lames, vous qui pleurez. You who weep for pleasures fled, while dragging on a life of care, all your woes will melt in air, if to God your tears are shed, you who weep. D'Artagnan and the curate appeared pleased. The Jesuit persisted in his opinion. Beware of a profane taste in your theological style. What says Augustine on this subject? Severus sit clericorum verbo. Yes, uh, let the sermon be clear, said the curate. Now, hastily interrupted the Jesuit, on seeing that his acolyte was going astray, now your thesis would please the ladies. It would have the success of one of Monsieur Patru's pleadings. Please God, cried Aramis, transported. Therefore it is, cried the Jesuit, the world still speaks within you in a loud voice. Altissime voce! You follow the world, my young friend, and I tremble lest grace prove not efficacious. Be satisfied, my reverend father. I can answer for myself. Mundane presumption! I know myself, father. My resolution is irrevocable. Then you persist in continuing that thesis i feel myself called upon to treat that and no other i will see about the continuation of it and tomorrow i hope you will be satisfied with the corrections i shall have made in consequence of your advice work slowly said the curate we leave you in an excellent tone of mind yes the ground is all sown said the jesuit and we have not to fear that one portion of the seed may have fallen upon stone another upon the highway or that the birds of heaven have eaten the rest aves jaili comederunt ilam plague stifle you in your latin said d'artagnan who began to feel all his patience exhausted farewell my son said the curate, till tomorrow. Till tomorrow, rash youth, said the Jesuit. You promise to become one of the lights of the church, 
Heaven grant that this light prove not a devouring fire! D'Artagnan, who for an hour past had been gnawing his nails with impatience, was beginning to attack the quick. The two men in black rose, bowed to Aramis and D'Artagnan, and advanced toward the door. Bazin, who had been standing, listening to all this controversy with a pious jubilation, sprang toward them, took the breviary of the curate and the missal of the Jesuit, and walked respectively before them to clear their way. Aramis conducted them to the foot of the stairs, and then immediately came up again to D'Artagnan, whose senses were still in a state of confusion. When left alone, the two friends at first kept an embarrassed silence. It, however, became necessary for one of them to break it first, and as D'Artagnan appeared determined to leave that honor to his companion, Aramis said, "'You see that I am returned to my fundamental ideas.' "'Yes, efficacious grace has touched you, as that gentleman said just now.' "'Oh, these plans of retreat have been formed for a long time. You have often heard me speak of them, have you not, my friend?' "'Yes, but I confess I always thought you jested.' "'With such things? Oh, d'Artagnan!' "'The devil! Why, people jest with death!' And people are wrong, D'Artagnan, for death is the door which leads to perdition or to salvation. Granted, but if you please, let us not theologize, Aramis. You must have had enough for today. As for me, I have almost forgotten the little Latin I have ever known. Then I confess to you that I have eaten nothing since ten o'clock this morning, and I am devilishly hungry. We will dine directly, my friend. Only you must please to remember that this is Friday. Now, on such a day, I can neither eat flesh nor see it eaten. If you can be satisfied with my dinner, it consists of cooked tetragones and fruits. What do you mean by tetragones? asked D'Artagnan e uneasily. I mean spinach, replied Aramis. But on your account I will add some eggs and that is a serious infraction of the rule, for eggs are meat, since they engender chickens. This feast is not very succulent, but never mind, I will put up with it for the sake of remaining with you. I am grateful to you for your sacrifice, said Aramis, but if your body be not greatly benefited by it, be assured your soul will. And so... Aramis, you are decidedly going into the church. What will our two friends say? What will Monsieur de Treville say? They will treat you as a deserter, I warn you. I do not enter the church, I re-enter it. I deserted the church for the world, for you know that I forced myself when I became a musketeer. I, I know nothing about it. You don't know I quit the seminary? Not at all. This is my story, then. Besides, the scriptures say, Confess yourself to one another, and I confess to you, D'Artagnan. And I give you absolution beforehand. You see, I am a good sort of man. Do not jest about holy things, my friend. Go on, then. I listen. I had been at the seminary from nine years old. In three days I should have been twenty. I was about to become an abbé, and all was arranged. One evening I went according to custom to a house which I frequented with much pleasure. When one is young, what can be expected? One is weak. An officer who saw me with a jealous eye, reading the lives of the saints to the mistress of the house, entered suddenly and without being announced. That evening I had translated an episode of Judith, and had just communicated my verses to the lady, who gave me all sorts of compliments, and leaning on my shoulder, was reading them a second time with me. Her pose, which I must admit was rather free, wounded this officer. He said nothing, but when I went out he followed and came up with me quickly. Monsieur the Abbe, said he, do you like blows with a cane? I cannot say, monsieur, answered I, 
no one has ever dared to give me any. Well, listen to me then, Monsieur the Abbé. If you venture again into that house in which I have met you this evening, I will dare it myself. I really think I must have been frightened. I became very pale. I felt my legs fail me. I sought for a reply, but could find none. I was silent. The officer waited for his reply, and seeing it so long coming, he burst into a laugh, turned upon his heel, and re-entered the house. I returned to the seminary. I am a gentleman born, and my blood is warm. As you may have remarked, my dear D'Artagnan, the insult was terrible, and although unknown to the rest of the world, I felt it live and fester in the bottom of my heart. I informed my superiors that I did not feel myself sufficiently prepared for ordination, and at my request the ceremony was postponed for a year. I sought out the best fencing-master in Paris. I made an agreement with him to take a lesson every day, and every day for a year I took that lesson. Then, on the anniversary of the day on which I had been insulted, I hung my cassock on a peg, assumed the costume of a cavalier, and went to a ball given by a lady friend of mine, and to which I knew my man was invited. It was in the Rue des Francs Bourgeois, close to La Fosse. As I expected, my officer was there. I went up to him as he was signing a love ditty, and looking tenderly at a lady, and interrupted him exactly in the middle of the second couplet. Monsieur, said I, does it still displease you that I should frequent a certain house of La Rue Payenne? And would you still cane me if I took it into my head to disobey you? The officer looked at me with astonishment and said, What is your business with me, monsieur? I do not know you. I am, said I, the little abbe who reads lives of the saints and translates Judith into verse. Aha, I recollect you now, said the officer in a jeering tone. Well, what do you want with me? I want you to spare time to take a walk with me. Tomorrow morning, if you like, with the greatest pleasure. No, not tomorrow morning, if you please, but immediately. If you absolutely insist, I do insist upon it. Come then, ladies, said the officer, do not disturb yourselves. Allow me time just to kill this gentleman, and I will return and finish the last couplet. We went out. I took him to the Rue Payenne, to the exact spot where, a year before, at the very same hour, he had paid me the compliment I have related to you. It was a superb moonlit night. We immediately drew, and at the first pass I laid him stark dead. "'The devil!' cried D'Artagnan. "'Now,' continued Aramis, "'as the ladies did not see the singer come back, and as he was found in the Rue Payenne with a great sword wound through his body, it was supposed that I had accommodated him thus, and the matter created some scandal, which obliged me to renounce the cassock for a time. Athos, whose acquaintance I made about that period, and Porthos, who had, in addition to my lessons, taught me some effective tricks of fence, prevailed upon me to solicit the uniform of a musketeer. The king entertained great regard for my father, who had fallen at the siege of Arras, and the uniform was granted. You may understand that the moment has come for me to re-enter the bosom of the church. And why today, rather than yesterday or tomorrow? What has happened to you today to raise all these melancholy ideas? This wound, my dear D'Artagnan, has been a warning to me from heaven. This wound? Bah! It is now nearly healed, and I am sure it is not that which gives you the most pain. What, then? said Aramis, blushing. You have one at heart, Aramis, one deeper and more painful, a wound made by a woman. The eye of Aramis kindled in spite of himself. Ah, uh, said he, dissembling his emotion under a feigned carelessness. Do not talk of such things and suffer love pains. Vanitas vanitatum. According to your idea, then, my brain is turned. And for whom for? Some grisette? Some chambermaid with whom I have trifled in some garrison? Fie! 
Pardon, my dear Aramis, but I thought you carried your eyes higher. Higher? And who am I to nourish such ambition? A poor musketeer, a beggar, an unknown who hates slavery and finds himself ill-placed in the world? Aramis, Aramis, cried D'Artagnan, looking at his friend with an air of doubt. Dust I am, and to dust I return. Life is full of humiliations and sorrows. Continued he, becoming still more melancholy. All the ties which attach him to life break in the hand of man, particularly the golden ties. Ah, my dear D'Artagnan, resumed Aramis, giving to his voice a slight tone of bitterness. Trust me. Conceal your wounds when you have any. Silence is the last joy of the unhappy. Beware of giving any one the clue to your griefs. The curious suck our tears as flies suck the blood of a wounded heart. Alas, my dear Aramis, said D'Artagnan, in his turn heaving a profound sigh, that is my story you are relating. How? Yes, a woman whom I love, whom I adore, has just been torn from me by force. I do not know where she is or whither they have conducted her. She is perhaps a prisoner. She is perhaps dead. Yes, but you have at least this consolation, that you can say to yourself she has not quit you voluntarily, that if you learn no news of her, it is because all communication with you is interdicted, while I... Well? Nothing, replied Aramis. Nothing. So you renounce the world, then? Forever? That is a settled thing? A resolution registered? Forever! You are my friend today. Tomorrow you will be no more to me than a shadow, or rather, even you will no longer exist. As for the world, it is a sepulcher, and nothing else. The devil! All this is very sad which you tell me. What will you? My vocation commands me. It carries me away. D'Artagnan smiled, but made no answer. Aramis continued, And yet, while I do belong to the earth, I wish to speak of you, of our friends. And on my part, said D'Artagnan, I wish to speak of you, but I find you so completely detached from everything. To love you, cry fie, friends or shadows, the world is a sepulchre. Alas, you will find it so yourself, said Aramis with a sigh. Well, then, let us say no more about it, said D'Artagnan, and let us burn this letter which no doubt announces to you some fresh infidelity of your grisette or your chambermaid. What letter? cried Aramis eagerly. A letter which was sent to your abode in your absence, and which was given to me for you. But from whom is that letter? Oh, from some heartbroken waiting woman, some desponding grisette, from Madame de Chevreuse's chambermaid, perhaps, who was obliged to return to Tours with her mistress, and who, in order to appear smart and attractive, stole some perfumed paper and sealed her letter with a duchess's coronet. What do you say? Hold, I must have lost it, said the young man maliciously, pretending to search for it. But fortunately the world is a sepulchre, the men and consequently the women are but shadows, and love is a sentiment to which you cry, Fie! Fie! D'Artagnan! D'Artagnan! cried Aramis. You are killing me! "'Well, oh, here it is at last,' said D'Artagnan, as he drew the letter from his pocket. Aramis made a bound, seized the letter, read it, or rather devoured it, his countenance radiant. "'The same waiting maid seems to have an agreeable style,' said the messenger carelessly. "'Thanks, D'Artagnan, thanks!' cried Aramis, almost in a state of delirium. "'She was forced to return to Tours. She is not faithless.' She still loves me, 
Come, my friend, come. Let me embrace you. Happiness almost stifles me. The two friends began to dance around the venerable St. Chrysostom, kicking about famously the sheets of the thesis which had fallen on the floor. At that moment, Bazin entered with the spinach and the omelet. "'Be off, you wretch!' cried Aramis, throwing his skull-cap in his face. "'Return whence you came. Take back those horrible vegetables and that poor kickshaw. Order a larded hare, a fat capon, mutton-leg dressed with garlic, and four bottles of old burgundy!' Bazin, who looked at his master without comprehending the cause of this change, in a melancholy manner, allowed the omelet to slip into the spinach, and the spinach onto the floor. "'Now this is the moment to consecrate your existence to the King of Kings,' said D'Artagnan. "'If you persist in offering him a civility, non inutile desiderium oblazione. "'Go to the devil with your Latin. Let us drink, my dear D'Artagnan. Morbleu! Let us drink while the wine is fresh. Let us drink heartily, and while we do so, tell me a little of what is going on in the world yonder. End of chapter 26 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 27 of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1, The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas Translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Wife of Athos We have now to search for Athos, said D'Artagnan to the vivacious Aramis, when he had informed him of all that had passed since their departure from the capital, and an excellent dinner had made one of them forget his thesis, and the other his fatigue. Do you think, then, that any harm can have happened to him? asked Aramis. Athos is cool, so brave, and handles his sword so skillfully. No doubt, nobody has a higher opinion of the courage and skill of Athos than I have, but I like better to hear my sword clang against lances than against staves. I fear lest Athos should have been beaten down by serving men. Those fellows strike hard, and don't leave off in a hurry. This is why I wish to set out again as soon as possible." "'I will try to accompany you,' said Aramis, "'though I scarcely feel in a condition to mount on horseback. "'Yesterday I undertook to employ that cord "'which you see hanging against the wall, "'but pain prevented my continuing this pious exercise. "'That's the first time I ever heard of anybody "'trying to cure gunshot wounds with a cat o' nine tails, "'but you were ill, and illness renders the head weak.' therefore you may be excused when do you mean to set out to-morrow at daybreak sleep as soundly as you can to-night and to-morrow if you can we will take our departure together till to-morrow then said aramis for iron nerved as you are you must need repose the next morning when d'artagnan entered aramis's chamber he found him at the window what are you looking at asked d'artagnan my faith i am admiring three magnificent horses which the stable boys are leading about it would be a pleasure worthy of a prince to travel upon such horses well my dear aramis you may enjoy that pleasure for one of those three horses is yours ah bah which whichever of the three you like i have no preference and the rich caparison is that mine, too? Without doubt. You laugh, D'Artagnan. No, I have left off laughing, now that you speak French. What, those rich holsters, that velvet housing, that saddle studded with silver, are they all for me? For you and nobody else, as the horse which paws the ground is mine, and the other horse which is caracoling belongs to Athos. Peste, they are three superb animals. I am glad they please you. Why, it must have been the king who made you such a present. Certainly it was not the cardinal, but don't trouble yourself whence they came. Think only that one of the three is your property. 
I choose that which the red-headed boy is leading. It is yours. Good heaven! That is enough to drive away all my pains. I could mount him with thirty balls in my body. On my soul, handsome stirrups! Hola, Bazin! Come here this minute! Bazin appeared on the threshold, dull and spiritless. That last order is useless, interrupted D'Artagnan. There are loaded pistols in your holsters. Bazin sighed. Come, Monsieur Bazin, make yourself easy, said D'Artagnan. People of all conditions gain the kingdom of heaven. Monsieur was already such a good theologian, said Bazin, almost weeping. He might have become a bishop and perhaps a cardinal. Well, my poor Bazin, reflect a little. Of what use is it to be a churchman, pray? You do not avoid going to war by that means. You see, the cardinal is about to make the next campaign, helm on head and partisan in hand, and Monsieur de Nocoré de la Vallette. What do you say of him? He is a cardinal likewise. Ask his lackey how often he has had to prepare lint of him. "'Alas!' sighed Bazin. "'I know it, monsieur. "'Everything is turned topsy-turvy in the world nowadays.' "'While this dialogue was going on, "'the two young men and the poor lackey descended. "'Hold my stirrup, Bazin!' cried Aramis, "'and Aramis sprang into the saddle with his usual grace and agility, "'but after a few vaults and curvets of the noble animal "'his rider felt his pains come on, so insupportably that he turned pale and became unsteady in his seat. D'Artagnan, who foreseeing such an event had kept his eye on him, sprang toward him, caught him in his arms, and assisted him to his chamber. "'That's all right, my dear Aramis. Take care of yourself,' said he. "'I will go alone in search of Athos.' "'You are a man of brass,' replied Aramis. No, I have good luck, that is all. But how do you mean to pass your time till I come back? No more theses, no more glosses upon the fingers or upon benedictions, hey? Aramis smiled. I will make verses, said he. Yes, I dare say, verses perfumed with the odor of the billet from the attendant of Madame de Chevreuse teach Bazin prosody. That will console him. As to the horse, ride him a little every day, and that will accustom you to his maneuvers. Oh, make yourself easy on that head, replied Aramis. You will find me ready to follow you. They took leave of each other, and in ten minutes, after having commended his friend to the cares of the hostess and Bazin, D'Artagnan was trotting along in the direction of Amiens. How was he going to find Athos? Should he find him at all? The position in which he left him was critical. He probably had succumbed. This idea, while darkening his brow, drew several sighs from him, and caused him to formulate to himself a few vows of vengeance. Of all his friends, Athos was the eldest, and the least resembling him in appearance in his tastes and sympathies. Yet he entertained a marked preference for this gentleman, the noble and distinguished heir of Athos, those flashes of greatness which from time to time broke out from the shade in which he voluntarily kept himself, that unalterable equality of temper which made him the most pleasant companion in the world, that forced and cynical gaiety, that bravery which might have been termed blind if it had not been the result of the rarest coolness, such qualities attracted more than the esteem, more than the friendship of D'Artagnan, they attracted his admiration. Indeed, when placed beside M. de Treville, the elegant and noble courtier, Athos in his most cheerful days might advantageously sustain a comparison. He was of middle height, but his person was so admirably shaped and so well proportioned that more than once in his struggles with Porthos he had overcome the giant whose physical strength was proverbial among the musketeers. His head with piercing eyes, a straight nose, a chin cut like that of Brutus, had altogether an indefinable character of grandeur and grace. His hands, of which he took little care, were the despair of Aramis, who cultivated his with almond paste and perfumed oil. The sound of his voice was at once penetrating and melodious, 
and then that which was inconceivable in Athos, who was always retiring, was that delicate knowledge of the world and of the usages of the most brilliant society, those manners of a high degree which appeared as if unconsciously to himself in his least actions. If a repast were on foot, Athos presided over it better than any other, placing every guest exactly in the rank which his ancestors had earned for him or that he had made for himself. If a question in heraldry were started, Athos knew all the noble families of the kingdom, their genealogy, their alliances, their coat of arms, and the origin of them. Etiquette had no minutia unknown to him. He knew what were the rights of the great landowners. He was profoundly versed in hunting and falconry, and had one day, when conversing on this great art, astonished even Louis the Thirteenth himself, who took a pride in being considered a past master therein. Like all the great nobles of that period, Athos rode and fenced to perfection, but still further his education had been so little neglected, even with respect to scholastic studies, so rare at this time among gentlemen, that he smiled at the scraps of Latin which Aramis sported and which Porthos pretended to understand. Two or three times even, to the great astonishment of his friends, he had, when Aramis allowed some rudimental error to escape him, replaced a verb in its right tense and a noun in its case. Besides, his probity was irreproachable in an age in which soldiers compromise so easily with their religion and their consciences, lovers with their rigorous delicacy of our era, and the poor with God's seventh commandment. This Athos, then, was a very extraordinary man. And yet this nature so distinguished, this creature so beautiful, this essence so fine, was seen to turn insensibly toward material life, as old men turn toward physical and moral imbecility. Athos, in his hours of gloom, and these hours were frequent, was extinguished as to the whole of the luminous portion of him, and his brilliant side disappeared as into profound darkness. Then the demigod vanished. He remained scarcely a man, his head hanging down, his eyes dull, his speech slow and painful. Athos would look for hours together at his bottle, his glass, or at Grimaud, who, accustomed to obey him by signs, read in the faint glance of his master his least desire, and satisfied it immediately. If the four friends were assembled at one of these moments, a word, thrown forth occasionally with a violent effort, was the share Athos furnished to the conversation. In exchange for this silence, Athos drank enough for four, and without appearing to be otherwise affected by wine than by a more marked constriction of the brow and by a deeper sadness. D'Artagnan, whose inquiring disposition we are acquainted with, had not, whatever interest he had in satisfying his curiosity on this subject, been able to assign any cause for these fits, or for the periods of their recurrence. Athos never received any letters. Athos never had concerns which all his friends did not know. It could not be said that it was wine which produced this sadness, for in truth he only drank to combat this sadness, which wine, however, as we have said, rendered still darker. The success of bilious humor could not be attributed to play, for unlike Porthos, who accompanied the variations of chance with songs or oath, Athos, when he won, remained as unmoved as when he lost. He had been known in the circle of the musketeers to win in one night three thousand pistoles, to lose them even to the gold-embroidered belt for gala days, win all this again with the addition of a hundred louis, without his beautiful eyebrow being heightened or lowered half a line, without his hands losing their pearly hue, without his conversation, which was cheerful that evening, ceasing to be calm and agreeable. Neither was it, as with our neighbors the English, an atmospheric influence which darkened his countenance, for the sadness generally became more intense toward the fine season of the year. June and July were the terrible months with Athos. For the present he had no anxiety. He shrugged his shoulders when people spoke of the future. His secret, then, was in the past, as had often been vaguely said to D'Artagnan. This mysterious shade spread over his whole person, rendered still more interesting the man whose eyes or mouth, even in the most complete intoxication, had never revealed anything, however skillfully questions had been put to him. Well, thought D'Artagnan, poor Athos is perhaps at this moment dead, and dead by my fault, for it was I who dragged him into this affair. 
of which he did not know the origin, of which he is ignorant of the result, and from which he can derive no advantage. Without reckoning, monsieur, added Planchet to his master's audibly expressed reflections, that we perhaps owe our lives to him. Do you remember how he cried, On, D'Artagnan, on, I am taken? And when he had discharged his two pistols, what a terrible noise he made with his sword! One might have said that twenty men, or rather twenty mad devils, were fighting. These words redoubled the eagerness of D'Artagnan, who urged his horse, though he stood in need of no excitement, and they proceeded at a rapid pace. About eleven o'clock in the morning they perceived Amiens, and at half-past eleven they were at the door of the cursed inn. D'Artagnan had often meditated against the perfidious host, one of those hearty vengeances which offer consolation while they are hoped for. He entered the hostelry with his hat pulled over his eyes, his left hand on the pommel of his sword, and cracking his whip with his right hand. "'Do you remember me?' said he to the host, who advanced to greet him. "'I have not that honor, Monseigneur,' replied the latter, his eyes dazzled by the brilliant style in which D'Artagnan traveled. "'What? You don't know me?' "'No, Monseigneur.' "'Well, two words will refresh your memory. What have you done with that gentleman against whom you had the audacity about twelve days ago to make an accusation of passing false money?' The host became as pale as death for D'Artagnan had assumed a threatening attitude, and Planchet modeled himself after his master. "'Ah, uh, Monseigneur, uh, do not mention it!' cried the host, in the most pitiable voice imaginable. "'Ah, uh, Monseigneur, how dearly have I paid for that fault, unhappy wretch as I am!' "'That gentleman, I say, what has become of him?' "'Deign to listen to me, Monseigneur, and be merciful, sit down in mercy d'artagnan mute with anger and anxiety took a seat in the threatening attitude of a judge planchet glared fiercely over the back of his armchair here is the story monseigneur resumed the trembling host for i now recollect you it was you who rode off at the moment i had that unfortunate difference with the gentleman you speak of yes it was i so you may plainly perceive that you have no mercy to expect if you do not tell me the whole truth. Condescend to listen to me, and you shall know all. I listen. I had been warned by the authorities that a celebrated coiner of bad money would arrive at my inn with several of his companions, all disguised as guards or musketeers. Monseigneur, I was furnished with a description of your horses, your lackeys, your countenances. Nothing was omitted. Go on, go on, said D'Artagnan, who quickly understood whence such an exact description had come. I took, then, in conformity with the orders of the authorities, who sent me a reinforcement of six men, such measures as I thought necessary to get possession of the persons of the pretended coiners. Again, said D'Artagnan, whose ears chafed terribly under the repetition of this word, coiners. Pardon me, monseigneur, for saying such things, but they form my excuse. The authorities had terrified me, and you know that an innkeeper must keep on good terms with the authorities. But once again, that gentleman, where is he? What has become of him? Is he dead? Is he living? Patience, monseigneur. We are coming to it. There happened then that which you know, and of which your precipitate departure, added the host with an acuteness that did not escape D'Artagnan, appeared to authorize the issue. That gentleman, your friend, defended himself desperately. His lackey, who by an unforeseen piece of ill luck had quarreled with the officers, disguised as stable lads. Miserable scoundrel, cried D'Artagnan. You were all in the plot, then, and I really don't know what prevents me from exterminating you all. Alas, Monseigneur, we were not in the plot, as you will see. Monsieur, your friend, pardon for not calling him by the honorable name which no doubt he bears, but we do not know that name. 
Monsieur, your friend, having disabled two men with his pistols, retreated fighting with his sword, with which he disabled one of my men and stunned me with a blow of the flat side of it. You villain, will you finish? cried D'Artagnan. Athos, what has become of Athos? While fighting and retreating, as I have told Monseigneur, he found the door of the cellar stairs behind him, and as the door was open he took out the key and barricaded himself inside. As we were sure of finding him there, we left him alone. Yes, said D'Artagnan. You did not really wish to kill. You only wished to imprison him. Good God! To imprison him, Monseigneur! Why, he imprisoned himself! I swear to you he did. In the first place, he had made rough work of it. One man was killed on the spot, and two others were severely wounded. The dead man and the two wounded were carried off by their comrades. And I have heard nothing of either of them since. As for myself, as soon as I recovered my senses, I went to Monsieur the Governor, to whom I related all that had passed, and asked, What should I do with my prisoner? Monsieur the Governor was all astonishment. He told me he knew nothing about that matter, that the orders I had received did not come from him, and that if I had the audacity to mention his name as being concerned in this disturbance, he would have me hanged. It appears that I had made a mistake, monsieur, that I had arrested the wrong person, and that he whom I ought to have arrested had escaped. But Athos, cried D'Artagnan, whose impatience was increased by the disregard of the authorities. Athos, where is he? As I was anxious to repair the wrongs I had done the prisoner, resumed the innkeeper, I took my way straight to the cellar in order to set him at liberty. Ah, monsieur, he was no longer a man, he was a devil. To my offer of liberty, he replied it was nothing but a snare, and that before he came out, he intended to impose his own conditions. I told him very humbly, for I could not conceal myself from the scrape I had got into by laying hands on one of His Majesty's musketeers. I told him I was quite ready to submit to his conditions. In the first place, said he, I wish my lackey placed with me fully armed. We hastened to obey this order, for you were pleased to understand, monsieur. We were disposed to do everything your friend could desire. Monsieur Grimaud, he told us his name, although he does not talk much. Monsieur Grimaud then went down to the cellar, wounded as he was. Then his master, having admitted him, barricaded the door afresh and ordered us to remain quietly in our own bar. But where is Athos now? cried D'Artagnan. Where is Athos? In the cellar, monsieur. What? You scoundrel! Have you kept him in the cellar all this time? Merciful heaven! No, monsieur. We keep him in the cellar. You do not know what he is about in the cellar. Ah! If you could but persuade him to come out, monsieur, I should owe you the gratitude of my whole life. I should adore you as my patron saint. Then he is there? I shall find him there. Without doubt you will, monsieur. He persists in remaining there. We every day pass through the air hole some bread at the end of a fork, and some meat when he asks for it. But alas, it is not of bread and meat of which he makes the greatest consumption. I once endeavored to go down with two of my servants, but he flew into a terrible rage. I heard the noise he made in loading his pistols, and his servant in loading his musketoon. Then... When we asked them what were their intentions, the master replied that he had forty charges to fire, and that he and his lackey would fire to the last one before he would allow a single soul of us to set foot in the cellar. Upon this I went and I complained to the governor, who replied that I only got what I deserved, and that it would teach me to insult honorable gentlemen who took up their abode in my house. So that since that time, replied D'Artagnan, totally unable to refrain from laughing at the pitiable face of the host. So from that time, monsieur, continued the latter, we have led the most miserable life imaginable. For you must know, monsieur, that all our provisions are in the cellar. 
There is our wine in bottles, our wine in casks, the beer, the oil, and the spices, the bacon and sausages. And as we are prevented from going down there, we are forced to refuse food and drink to the travelers who come to the house, so that our hostelry is daily going to ruin. If your friend remains another week in my cellar, I shall be a ruined man. And not more than justice either, you ass. Could you not perceive by our appearance that we were people of quality and not coiners, say? Yes, monsieur, you are right, said the host. But hark, hark, there he is. Somebody has disturbed him without doubt, said D'Artagnan. But he must be disturbed, cried the host. Here are two English gentlemen just arrived. Well? Well, the English like good wine, as you may know, monsieur. These have asked for the best. My wife has perhaps requested permission of Monsieur Athos to go into the cellar to satisfy these gentlemen, and he, as usual, has refused. Ah, good heaven! There is the hullabaloo louder than ever! D'Artagnan, in fact, heard a great noise on the side next the cellar. He rose and proceeded by the host wringing his hands and followed by Planchet with his musketoon ready for use. He approached the scene of action. The two gentlemen were exasperated. They had had a long ride and were dying with hunger and thirst. "'But this is tyranny!' cried one of them in very good French, though with a foreign accent. "'That this madman will not allow these good people access to their own wine. Nonsense! Let us break open the door, and if he is too far gone in his madness, well, we will kill him!' "'Softly, gentlemen,' said D'Artagnan, drawing his pistols from his belt. You will kill nobody, if you please. Good, good, cried the calm voice of Athos from the other side of the door. Let them come in, these devourers of little children, and we shall see. Brave as they appeared to be, the two Englishmen looked at each other hesitatingly. One might have thought there was in that cellar one of those famished ogres, the gigantic heroes of popular legends, into whose cavern nobody could force their way with impunity. There was a moment of silence, but at length the two Englishmen felt ashamed to draw back, and the angrier one descended the five or six steps which led to the cellar, and gave a kick against the door enough to split a wall. Planchet, said D'Artagnan, cocking his pistols, "'I will take charge of the one at the top. You look to the one below. Ha, ah, gentlemen, you want battle, and you shall have it.' Good. God, cried the hollow voice of Athos, I can hear D'Artagnan, I think. Yes, cried D'Artagnan, raising his voice in turn. I am here, my friend. Ah, good. Then, replied Athos, we will teach them these door-breakers. The gentlemen had drawn their swords, but they found themselves taken between two fires. They still hesitated an instant, but... As before, pride prevailed, and a second kick split the door from bottom to top. "'Stand on one side, D'Artagnan, stand on one side,' cried Athos. "'I am going to fire.' "'Gentlemen,' exclaimed D'Artagnan, whom reflection never abandoned, "'gentlemen, think of what you are about. Patience, Athos. You are running your heads into a very silly affair. You will be riddled. My lackey and I will have three shots at you, and you will get as many from the cellar. You will then have our swords, with which I can assure you, my friend, I can play tolerably well. Let me conduct your business and my own. You shall soon have something to drink. I give you my word. If there is any left, grumbled the jeering voice of Athos. The host felt a cold sweat creep down his back. How? "'If there is any left,' murmured he. "'What the devil! There must be plenty left,' replied D'Artagnan. "'Be satisfied of that. These two cannot have drunk all the cellar. Gentlemen, return your swords to their scabbards.' "'Well, provided you replace your pistols in your belt.' "'Willingly,' and D'Artagnan set the example. Then, turning toward Planchet, he made him a sign to uncock his musketoon. The Englishmen, convinced of these peaceful proceedings, sheathed their swords grumblingly. The history of Athos's imprisonment was then related to them, and as they were really gentlemen, 
they pronounced the host in the wrong. "'Now, gentlemen,' said D'Artagnan, "'go up to your room again, and in ten minutes I will answer for it. You shall have all you desire.' The Englishman bowed and went upstairs. "'Now I am alone, my dear Athos,' said D'Artagnan. "'Open the door, I beg of you.' "'Instantly,' said Athos. Then was heard a great noise of faggots being removed and of groaning of posts. These were the counterscarps and bastions of Athos, which the besieged himself demolished. An instant after, the broken door was removed, and the pale face of Athos appeared, who with a rapid glance took a survey of the surroundings. D'Artagnan threw himself on his neck and embraced him tenderly. He then tried to draw him from his moist abode, but to his surprise he perceived that Athos staggered. "'You are wounded,' said he. "'I, not at all. I am dead drunk, that's all, and never did a man more strongly set about getting so. By the Lord, my good host, I must have at least drunk for my part a hundred and fifty bottles. Mercy!' cried the host. "'If the lackey has drunk only half as much as the master, I am a ruined man.' Grimald is a well-bred lackey. He would never think of faring in the same manner as his master. He only drank from the cask. Hark! I don't think he put the faucet in again. Do you hear it? It is running now. D'Artagnan burst into a laugh, which changed the shiver of the host into a burning fever. In the meantime, Grimald appeared in his turn behind his master, with the musketoon on his shoulder and his head shaking, like one of those drunken satyrs in the pictures of Rubens. He was moistened before and behind with a greasy liquid, which the host recognized as his best olive oil. The four crossed the public room and proceeded to take possession of the best apartment in the house, which D'Artagnan occupied with authority. In the meantime, the host and his wife hurried down with lamps into the cellar, which had so long been interdicted to them, and where a frightful spectacle awaited them. Beyond the fortifications through which Athos had made a breach in order to get out, and which were composed of faggots, planks, and empty casks, heaped up according to all the rules of the strategic art, they found swimming in puddles of oil and wine, the bones and fragments of all the hams they had eaten, while a heap of broken bottles filled the whole left-hand corner of the cellar, and a ton, the cock of which was left running, was yielding by this means the last drop of its blood. The image of devastation and death, as the ancient poet says, reigned as over a field of battle. Of fifty large sausages suspended from the joints, scarcely ten remained. Then the lamentations of the host and hostess pierced the vault of the cellar, D'Artagnan himself was moved by them. Athos did not even turn his head. To grief succeeded rage. The host armed himself with a spit and rushed into the chamber occupied by the two friends. "'Some wine!' said Athos on perceiving the host. "'Some wine!' cried the stupefied host. "'Some wine! Why, you have drunk more than a hundred pistoles worth! I am a ruined man! Lost!' destroyed bah said athos we were always dry if you had been contented with drinking well and good but you have broken all the bottles you pushed me upon a heap which rolled down that was your fault all my oil is lost Oil is a sovereign balm for wounds, and my poor Grimaud here was obliged to dress those you had inflicted on him. All oh, my sausages are gnawed! There is an enormous quantity of rats in that cellar. You shall pay me for all this, cried the exasperated host. Triple ass, said Athos, rising but he sank down again immediately. He had tried his strength to the utmost. D'Artagnan came to his relief with his whip in his hand. The host drew back and burst into tears. "'This will teach you,' said D'Artagnan, 
to treat the guests God sends you in a more courteous fashion. God, say the devil! My dear friend, said D'Artagnan, if you annoy us in this manner, we will all four go and shut ourselves up in your cellar, and we will see if the mischief is as great as you say. Oh, gentlemen, said the host, I have been wrong. I confess it, but pardon to every sin. You are gentlemen, and I am a poor innkeeper. You will have pity on me. Ah, if you speak in that way, said Athos, you will break my heart, and the tears will flow from my eyes as the wine flowed from the cask. We are not such devils as we appear to be. Come hither, and let us talk. The host approached with hesitation. Come hither, I say, and don't be afraid, continued Athos. At the very moment when I was about to pay you, I had placed my purse on the table. Yes, monsieur. That purse contained sixty pistoles. Where is it? Deposited with the justice. They said it was bad money. Very well. Get me my purse back and keep the sixty pistoles. But Monseigneur knows very well that justice never lets go that which it once lays hold of. If it were bad money, there might be some hopes, but unfortunately, those were all good pieces. Manage the matter as well as you can, my good man. It does not concern me, the more so as I have not a lever left. Come, said D'Artagnan, let us inquire further. Athos's horse, where is that? In the stable. How much is it worth? Fifty pistoles at most. It's worth eighty. Take it, and there ends the matter. What? cried Athos. Are you selling my horse, my Bajazet? And pray, upon what shall I make my campaign? Upon Grimaud? I have brought you another, said D'Artagnan. Another? And a magnificent one, cried the host. Well, since there is another finer and younger, why, you may take the old one and let us drink. What? asked the host, quite cheerful again. Some of that at the bottom, near the laths. There are twenty-five bottles left of it. All the rest were broken by my fall. Bring six of them. Why, this man is a cask, said the host aside. If he only remains here a fortnight and pays for what he drinks, I shall soon re-establish my business. And don't forget, said D'Artagnan, to bring up four bottles of the same sort for the two English gentlemen. And now, said Athos, while they bring the wine, tell me, D'Artagnan, what has become of the others? Come. D'Artagnan related how he had found Porthos in bed with a strained knee, and Aramis at a table between two theologians. As he finished, the host entered with the wine ordered and a ham, which, fortunately for him, had been left out of the cellar. That's well, said Athos, filling his glass and that of his friend. Here's to Porthos and Aramis. But you, D'Artagnan, what is the matter with you? And what has happened to you personally? You have a sad air. Alas, said D'Artagnan, it is because I am the most unfortunate. Tell me. Presently, said D'Artagnan. Presently? And why presently? Because you think I am drunk. D'Artagnan, remember this. My ideas are never so clear as when I have had plenty of wine. Speak, then. I am all ears. D'Artagnan related his adventure with Madame Bonacieux. Athos listened to him without a frown, and when he had finished said, Trifles, only trifles. That was his favorite word. You always say trifles, my dear Athos, said D'Artagnan, 
and that come very ill from you, who have never loved. The drink-deadened eye of Athos flashed out, but only for a moment. It became as dull and vacant as before. "'That's true,' said he quietly. "'For my part, I have never loved.' "'Acknowledge, then, you stony heart,' said D'Artagnan, "'that you are wrong to be so hard upon us tender hearts.' "'Tender hearts, pierced hearts,' said Athos. "'What do you say? "'I say that love is a lottery in which he who wins, wins death. "'You are very fortunate to have lost. "'Believe me, my dear D'Artagnan, "'and if I have any counsel to give, it is always lose.' "'She seemed to love me so.' "'She seemed, did she?' "'Oh, she did love me.' "'You child, why, there is not a man who has not believed, as you do, that his mistress loved him, and there lives not a man who has not been deceived by his mistress.' "'Except you, Athos, who never had one.' "'That's true,' said Athos, after a moment's silence. "'That's true. I never had one.' let us drink but then philosopher that you are said d'artagnan instruct me support me i stand in need of being taught and consoled consoled for what for my misfortune your misfortune is laughable said athos shrugging his shoulders i should like to know what you would say if i were to relate to you a real tale of love which has happened to you or one of my friends what matters tell it athos tell it better if i drink drink and relate then not a bad idea said athos emptying and refilling his glass the two things agree marvelously well I am all attention, said D'Artagnan. Athos collected himself, and in proportion as he did so, D'Artagnan saw that he became pale. He was at that period of intoxication in which vulgar drinkers fall on the floor and go to sleep. He kept himself upright and dreamed without sleeping. This somnambulism of drunkenness had something frightful in it. You particularly wish it? asked he. I pray for it, said D'Artagnan. Be it then as you desire. One of my friends, one of my friends, please to observe, not myself, said Athos, interrupting himself with a melancholy smile. One of the counts of my province, that is to say, of very noble as a Dandolo or a Montmorency at twenty-five years of age, fell in love with a girl of sixteen, beautiful as fancy can paint. Through the ingeniousness of her age beamed an ardent mind, not of a woman, but of the poet. She did not please. She intoxicated. She lived in a small town with her brother, who was a curate, both had recently come into the country. They came nobody knew whence, but when seeing her so lovely and her brother so pious, nobody thought of asking whence they came. They were said, however, to be of good extraction. My friend, who was seigneur of the country, might have seduced her or taken her by force at his will, for he was master. Who would have come to the assistance of two strangers, two unknown persons? Unfortunately, he was an honorable man. He married her. The fool! The ass! The idiot! How so if he love her? asked D'Artagnan. Wait, said Athos. He took her to his chateau and made her the first lady in the province and in justice it must be allowed that she supported her rank 
becomingly. "'Well?' asked D'Artagnan. "'Well, one day, when she was hunting with her husband,' continued Athos in a low voice and speaking very quickly, "'she fell from her horse and fainted. The Count flew to her to help, and, as she appeared to be oppressed by her clothes, he ripped them open with his poniard, and in so doing laid bare her shoulder. "'D'Artagnan,' said Athos, with a maniacal burst of laughter, "'Guess what she had on her shoulder!' "'How can I tell?' said D'Artagnan. "'A fleur-de-lis,' said Athos. "'She was branded.' Athos emptied at a single draught the glass he held in his hand. "'Horror!' cried D'Artagnan. "'What do you tell me?' "'Truth, my friend. The angel was a demon. The poor young girl had stolen the sacred vessels from a church.' "'And what did the Count do?' "'The Count was of the highest nobility. He had on his estates the rights of high and low tribunals. He tore the dress of the Countess to pieces, he tied her hands behind her, and hanged her on a tree.' "'Heavens! Athos! A murder!' cried D'Artagnan. No less, said Athos, as pale as a corpse. But methinks I need wine. And he seized by the neck the last bottle that was left, put it to his mouth, and emptied it at a single draught, as he would have emptied an ordinary glass. Then he let his head sink upon his two hands, while D'Artagnan stood before him stupefied. That has cured me of beautiful, poetical and loving women," said Athos, after a considerable pause, raising his head and forgetting to continue the fiction of the Count. "'God grant you as much. Let us drink.' "'Then she is dead?' stammered D'Artagnan. "'Parbleu!' said Athos. "'But hold out your glass. Some ham, my boy, or we can't drink.' "'And her brother?' added D'Artagnan timidly. "'Her brother?' replied Athos. "'Yes, the priest.' "'Oh, I inquired after him for the purpose of hanging him likewise. But he was beforehand with me. He had quit the curacy the night before.' "'Was it ever known who this miserable fellow was?' "'He was doubtless the first lover and accomplice of the fair lady.' A worthy man, who had pretended to be a curate for the purpose of getting his mistress married and securing her a position, he has been hanged and quartered, I hope. "'My God! My God!' cried D'Artagnan, quite stunned by the relation of this horrible adventure. "'Taste some of this ham, D'Artagnan. It is exquisite.' said Athos, cutting a slice, which he placed on the young man's plate. "'What a pity it is there were only four like this in the cellar! I could have drunk fifty bottles more!' D'Artagnan could no longer endure this conversation, which had made him bewildered. Allowing his head to sink upon his two hands, he pretended to sleep. "'These young fellows can none of them drink!' said Athos, looking at him with pity. And yet, this is one of the best. End of chapter 27 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia